Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Contest alert. This week, we have a jam-packed intro, including a new contest we're launching. So please bear with me. You don't want to miss this one. First, a bit about this week's shows. As you may know, I spent a few days at CES earlier this month. While there, I spoke with a bunch of folks applying AI in the consumer electronics industry, and I'm including you in those conversations via this series of shows. Stay tuned as we explore some of the very cool ways that machine learning and AI are being used to enhance our everyday lives. This includes work being done at Anki, who built Cosmo, the cutest little computer vision powered robot. Lighthouse, whose smart home security camera combines 3D sensing with deep learning and NLP. Intel, who's using the single shot multi box image detection algorithm to personalize video feeds for the Ferrari Challenge North America. FirstBeat, a company whose machine learning algorithms analyze your heartbeat data to provide personalized insights into stress, exercise, and sleep patterns. Reality AI and Koito, who have partnered to bring machine learning-based adaptive driving beams or automatically adjusting high beams to the US. And last but not least, Aerial.ai, who applies sophisticated analytics to Wi-Fi signals to enable some really interesting home automation and healthcare applications. Now, as if six amazing interviews wasn't enough, a few of these companies have been so kind as to provide us with products for you, the Twimmel community. In keeping with the theme of this series, our contest will be a little different this time. To enter, We want to hear from you about the role AI is playing in your home and personal life and where you see it going. Just head on over to twimmelai.com slash myaicontest, fire up your webcam or smartphone camera, and tell us your story in two minutes or less. We'll post the videos to YouTube, and the video with the most likes wins their choice of great prizes, including an Anki Cosmo, a Lighthouse smart home camera, and more. Submissions will be taken until February 11th, and voting will remain open until February 18th. Good luck. Before we dive into today's show, I'd like to thank our friends at Intel AI for their continued support of this podcast. Intel was extremely active at this year's CES, with a bunch of AI, autonomous driving, and VR-related announcements. One of the more interesting partnerships they announced was a collaboration with the Ferrari Challenge North America race series. Along with the folks at Ferrari Challenge, Intel AI aspires to make the race viewing experience more personalized by using deep computer vision to detect and monitor individual race cars via camera feeds and allow viewers to choose the specific car's feeds that they'd like to watch. Look for my conversation with Intel's Andy Keller and Emil Chindicki later in this series for an in-depth discussion about this project, and be sure to visit ai.intel.com where you'll find Andy's technical blog post on the topic. And now, a bit about today's show. In this episode, I sit down with Alex Teichman, CEO and co-founder of Lighthouse, a company taking a new approach to the in-home smart security camera. Alex and I dig into what exactly the Lighthouse product is and all of the interesting stuff inside, including its combination of 3D sensing, computer vision, and natural language processing. We also talk about Alex's process for building the Lighthouse network architecture, the tech stack the product is based on, and some things that surprised him in their efforts to get AI into a consumer product. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am here at CES, and I've got the pleasure of being seated with Alex Teichman. Alex is the CEO and co-founder of Lighthouse. Alex, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Excellent. Thank you. Absolutely. Great to have you uh, on the show. Uh, So um, why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background? You've done some interesting things in the uh, AI sphere. Ah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So so my background is in perception systems for self-driving cars. Um, this is all about getting them to understand what they see in the world. 
Mm -hmm. um, what is a car and what is a bicyclist and what is a, a, a pedestrian and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I joined Sebastian Thrun's lab uh, back in uh, 2007, uh, right when the DARPA challenges uh, were wrapping up. Mm -hmm. What were some of the specific things you were working on there? Um, so my focus was on how you use 3D sensing, LIDAR in particular in that case, um, to do a better job of understanding uh, what you're seeing in the world, you being a self-driving car or a computer more generally. So this is very different from using a regular color camera to understand what you see in the world. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a 3D sensor, um, you've got the full structure to work with um, in real time. And that opens up a, a variety of different computer vision techniques. And mm -hmm. it makes many of the very difficult computer vision sub-problems um, quite easy. Uh, mm. Not all of them, but it makes many of them easy. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah, so for example, um, segmentation and tracking of objects for which you have no computer vision model mm -hmm. is extraordinarily difficult with regular video. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have a 3D sensor, and when certain assumptions are, are met, then you can do a very good job segmenting and tracking objects, even if you have no idea what they are, if you okay. have no semantic information whatsoever. Um, and this is something that's made use of very heavily in the self-driving car world, mm -hmm. um, where uh, you can see that there is a physical thing in the structure of the environment, and it's moving around. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know what it is to drive safely around it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there seems to be a, uh, you know, there's a school of thought in and around the self-driving cars that um, is taking advantage of what you're describing using LiDAR and things like that. But then there's another school of thought where folks are saying LiDAR is too expensive to be, you know, on every production vehicle. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to try and do things with uh, just cameras. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that? It's hard. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> it's all, all of it's hard? No, 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 no. Well... Um, getting all the stuff to work with just regular color cameras, it will eventually happen, right? The information is all there and humans do it with what essentially amounts to just a camera. Stereo is not effectively, you know, it's not very effective at that range, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, and, and we are just machines in some sense, right? Very mm -hmm. complex, very sophisticated machines, but like we, we are able to do it. So the information is there and eventually uh, we will get computers to be able to do that sort of thing. Um, but we, we seem to be a long way off from that. It is yeah. quite hard. This is why virtually every self-driving car project is using LiDAR mm -hmm. because it, it makes many of those hard problems a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so fast forward uh, to Lighthouse. What's Lighthouse up to? Yeah. So so the story of Lighthouse. Um, so um, we were talking a lot about self-driving cars here. It's what we're doing is basically we're taking that set of, um, of computer vision um, and machine perception techniques, and we're translating that from the self-driving car world um, into the home. Okay. Um, that's the that's the technology perspective on what Lighthouse is. That's the machine learning perspective. From the uh, the customer perspective, Lighthouse is um, imagine you had a traditional home camera, mm -hmm. but it had the intelligence of something like Alexa or Google Home. Okay. It's a new kind of interactive assistant that's based on this 3D sensing and, and computer vision and, and cameras um, that lets you tell it what you care about, and then it tells you when it sees those things happen. And is the application, uh, is it security or personal virtual assistant or it's something both. beyond? It's both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so give me an example of how I, might, uh, how I might use it. Yeah. So one thing you can do with Lighthouse is you can say, um, tell me if you don't see the kids by 4 p.m. on weekdays. Okay. And you literally just say those words, that's it. It understands what you're asking for. It has a very good computer vision model for what children are. It knows what they look like. Mm -hmm. um, and it knows that you're asking for, you know, by 4 p.m. on weekdays, Monday through Friday. And if it doesn't see children by that time, Monday through mm. Friday, it'll send you a notification. Okay. Um, and if it does, then it won't bother you. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. I, uh, a few years ago, I was, I had some crazy project that I was going to do around the, the house and, and, one of the first things I started trying to figure out was presence. And this was pre like deep learning, CNNs, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I started looking at, you know, NFC and all these other kinds of things. Um, and it's just so obvious now that vision is, the, you know, cameras and vision is the way to do this. Uh -huh. um, what are some of the challenges associated with uh, deploying a kind of a vision appliance, I guess, in the, the home environment? Mm -hmm. um, well, 
everything in computer vision is is hard to some degree, right? Because it's new, we're kind of just at the, in like the dawn of artificial intelligence here, and right. all of this, all of these, you know, different techniques are are very cutting edge. Um, so we're really pushing the boundaries and what's possible with deep learning, um, and combining that intelligently with the um, you know the sorts of techniques you can use with three D sensing, um, mm -hmm. in particular around segmentation and tracking. Um, there is a lot of complexity and a lot of difficulty around building the hardware to do this too, um, because this hmm. is the first three D sensor um, that uh, you know has ninety five degree uh, diagonal field of view that can see out to you know uh, depends on the details, but you know seven to ten meters is typical. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite challenging to put all that stuff together. Um, hardware is hard is is a you know is the phrase for a reason. Right, right, right. Yeah. So is the device itself is it kind of a, kind of a connect plus a camera? You can actually kind of think of it that way. Um, so it uses a different um, uh, underlying depth sensing technique. Uh, it's a, um, uh, actually, it depends on which Kinect you're referring to. So the original Kinect <laughs> was, uh, was structured light, and then it's okay. kind of like stereo. There's like a texture pattern going out. Um, a projector, and you know where that projector is, and there's an infrared camera, and you can triangulate from that. Okay. That was the original Connect. Uh, that was actually what we prototyped Lighthouse on in the very beginning. Okay. Um, and what we're using now is a time of flight camera, where that sends out modulated light, and then you look at um, the phase shift between that modulated light as it returns, okay. um, and a reference signal, and that phase shift. Um, uh, tells you how far away things are essentially. So, like at every pixel in the image, not only do you see, you know, oh, it's you know, it's like this shade of brown. You also see um, it's three point seven two meters away. Okay. You get that for the whole scene. Oh, interesting. I uh, trying to remember the name of this thing. There was a Kickstarter that I backed. I haven't done anything with this thing yet, but it was like a mini lidar scans. I think was the name of it. Have you ever come across that? I haven't come across that one, but was it for scanning your face or yourself? No, it was or like, something? it was kind of a, you know, for hobbyists, uh, you could, you know, put it on a mobile robot and just experiment with it, that kind of mm. thing. I don't think there was any like specific end user use case associated with it. Okay. But it was focused on kind of, I think it was just an example of, you know, the, the you know, how to scale LiDAR down to something that fits in the palm of your hand and okay. is relatively cheap. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one, but um, but you know the both generations of the Kinect are a good example. Um, the iPhone X has mm -hmm. a three D sensor built into it, and that's also mm -hmm. a good example. They use that to to make Face ID actually reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you know self driving cars, obviously, with the, all the different varieties of lidar that's out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, maybe a little bit more detail around the the some more examples of kind of use cases for the device itself might be helpful. Yeah, yeah, so I mentioned the one about like if the children don't come home by a particular time. Mm -hmm. And is uh, it just children or is it like if Bobby doesn't come home or Susie doesn't come home, like do you, are you able to, to identify specific faces and associate them with, mm -hmm. with kids or is it just children? Yeah. Yeah, so, so you can do either, in fact, um, with Lighthouse. Um, so Lighthouse has the ability to understand that, oh, that is a child generally. It okay. also has the ability to understand um, faces of specific people. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, what, what that is most useful for um, is so you can do something like, say, to Lighthouse, um, you know, hey, tell me if you see someone you don't recognize while yeah. Cindy and I are away, for okay. example. Um, and that lets you get at, you know, um, I don't know, if your children bring home a new friend um, while you and your wife are out at work or something, and you, you right. might just want to know, like, oh, who is this new person? And it'll, it'll tell you about it. It'll send okay. you a push notification when it sees that. Hmm. Um, or if, you know, you have a dog walker or a babysitter, and one day it's somebody different or somebody mm -hmm. new is there, right? It'll proactively notify you about this. You mm -hmm. don't have to go back and check every day, okay. right? Because you have set up this alert um, with natural language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just occurring to me that as you were describing these use cases that, you know, as complex as the, you know, the computer vision and the, the 3D sensing is, there's also a, an NLP challenge. Like, how do you, how do you capture, you know, the full breadth of what someone's going to want to ask this thing? Uh -huh. um, are there, you know, we've talked uh, a bit on the podcast about some of the underlying NLP technologies and uh, spoke with someone on the Alexa team. Like, are there unique challenges associated with the way you're using uh, NLP in the context of this device? Um, I, so I wouldn't say there's, there's necessarily, um, I don't know, unique research challenges on the natural language processing mm -hmm. side. Um, there are, uh, are difficult and important uh, engineering challenges mm -hmm. that we need to nail on that side of things. 
Um, it's the computer vision where the really um, the really heavy duty uh, you know research grade techniques mm -hmm. um, are being deployed, at least for the current generation mm -hmm. of Lighthouse. Um, I mean, you can imagine uh, you know Google Assistant needs to answer virtually any question you could throw at right, it. Right. Um, with Lighthouse, there's there's actually a more restricted set of things. You know, mm -hmm. if you ask Lighthouse for you know directions from like you know here to wherever, like we, right. we like we don't do that. That's not what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but for the set of things that we understand on the perception side like we're you know it's actually we're very good at being able to answer those questions mm. um, it's a more constrained space that makes the problem easier there's more structure in it okay and so do you you know when you're providing kind of the user manual for this thing like are you telling someone these are the 10 things you could ask it or are you setting the expectation that they should just be able to ask it things related to the kinds of stuff that it can do. Yeah, so so we we float rotating suggestions in front of people um, okay. in the app. Okay. Right. So like so when you're um, in the kind of the natural language interface screen, you'll see here is you know here's the set of things you might consider asking. Some examples of these things right. in this category, and mm -hmm. it kind of guides you through what categories of things we understand, um, and that includes um, you know for object recognition, it's you know people and children and and pets and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, for action recognition, we recognize waving. Um, at the device. Mm -hmm. um, so you can say something like, hey, tell me if you see someone waving hello while I'm out. Right? Okay. That kind of thing. Um, hmm. We understand um, uh, you know, time ranges. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, allow you to set up um, alerts for things that happen in the future and so on. We'll kind of guide you through those different categories mm -hmm. of what we do. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so on the computer vision side, what are kind of the key research level challenges that you're tackling? Mm -hmm. um, so it, what it is really coming down to is applying deep learning at a large scale with 3D sensors combined with color cameras. Um, and there's there are um, particular things that this setup let you do that you just can't do in any other domain. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for example, the 3D sensor lets you segment and track objects through the space mm -hmm. um, without you having to have any sort of semantic understanding. You don't have to know what that thing is. You just know it's a thing and it's moving through the space. Mm. Now, your unit of classification from a deep learning point of view is that segmented object track through space and time. Mm -hmm. And this, this enables several things. One, it's just more accurate because mm -hmm. you have more views of an object as it's moving about, and you can integrate all of that information. Mm -hmm. um, and two, it's a very, very natural setup for doing action recognition, um, because you've got this, you know, this thing moving through space and time, and you can ask questions like, is this a dog? But also, you know, is this a dog jumping up on my couch? Or mm -hmm. is this a person waving hello? Or, you know, and so on. Um, uh, so it, it's a great setup for working on these kinds of, of, uh, of very challenging computer vision problems. Okay. Yeah. You've talked about kind of segmenting the you know these objects, and I'm thinking about this primarily being driven by the 3D sensor. In what ways does having the camera augment what you're able to do, you know, beyond just the 3D point cloud? Oh, um, well, so the so w at deep learning time. It's a specialized architecture that's using both of those channels. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the uh, almost the attentional mechanism, if you want to, you know, if you want to call it that, yeah, that's primarily driven by the three D sensor. Um, but then once you're kind of analyzing what is this thing, mm -hmm. now we use everything we have. Um, okay, in, you know, and that is including the the three D sensor data, the point cloud of the object, right? yeah, um, as well as the color camera data. We combine these things in a deep learning architecture that uses both of those, and then and then you know merges them, and then goes into an LSTM, right, okay. for for doing like you know uh, understanding of um, what is happening over time, right? Okay, and so how do you? What was the process for kind of coming up with the the network architecture for this thing? Uh, um, Did are you, you start familiar? with something off the shelf like Inception, or you know, name your network architecture, or did you build it up from the ground up? Yeah, so. Um, I mean, in this kind of context, it always makes sense to start from a baseline that's reasonably easy to just you know pull the pull a thing out of the box and deploy it, see what happens. Right. Right. And so we did that with you know Google Net 100 years ago just to see what would occur. Yeah. Um, and you know, it was you know, it did something. It was good. Mm -hmm. um, but it was pretty clear that we need to customize this thing to get the level of of accuracy that we really want. Yeah. Um, and then the process from there is. Um, well, are you familiar with the, the phrase "graduate student descent"? Sure. Okay. Yes. So I mean, that's that. that I mean, um, <laughs> but I mean, it, it really it uh, it's you know it's intuition um, combined with uh, significant perseverance combined with lots of compute. Right. Right. 
Yeah, and, I think like, the, the uh, current like way a, of saying that post NIPS uh, 2017 is alchemy. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of alchemy. Right? I mean, it's kind of sad actually, uh, in that like a lot of my a lot of my PhD work was kind of like during the age when you know proper machine learning techniques should be you know convex, right? Uh-huh. And just like yeah, it's a descent method. Like you're always going downhill and just like roll to the bottom and you'll find the solution. It'll be right. great, right? Right. Um, and now it's just it's non-convex and just like yeah, maybe it's working and maybe it's not working and you know oh I don't know try a try a different momentum term and like maybe it'll work yeah. this time, right? And that mm. it has its. It has challenges and uh, uh, advantages too, right? Like now things actually work. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. You know, for folks that are trying to productize around uh, deep neural networks, like what? Um, I don't know. I, I guess you know. I guess I struggle with the the graduate student descent as the answer, right? I guess you uh-huh. know, probably we all do a little bit. Um, have you developed you know any intuition or rigor around uh, or methodology rather around Kind of the way you, um, you know, the way you build out network architectures for for this problem space, or even maybe another question as background is like, was the network architecture like upfront work that you did, and it's kind of static, or is it what? How how rapidly does that evolve? So so that is an ongoing effort um, mm-hmm. in many different ways. Um, so in one way, um, we are um, you know collecting new annotated data all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, both from our own early access testers who provide us access to their data mm-hmm. for us to use for training purposes, um, and also um, if there is a mistake in the field, you can you can annotate it as such, and we'll make use of it and improve the models. And we have, we okay. have a stream of annotated data coming in, um, and so we're always taking the same network structure and taking that new training data and turning the crank and redeploying. Um, mm-hmm. And that cycle, I mean, it depends on the details, but that's on the order of days, mm-hmm. right? Um, the new architecture deployment cycle. Um, that's more like weeks or months as we, mm-hmm. you know, we come up with some new idea of like, oh, what if, you know, maybe we can compress the network this way, or maybe it would make a lot of sense to, you know, build out this piece of the network and then we'll go work very hard and validate that, that new network and find out, oh, indeed, this, you know, reduces compute time on our end and produces a better experience for the customer. Great. Let's go deploy this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's all about large scale quantitative testing. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned compressing the architecture. Are you deploying the a network on the device, or are you doing inference in the cloud or something like that? It's largely in the cloud okay. um, at the moment. There's a variety of reasons that make sense, um, although I should mention it is not entirely in the cloud. Um, it really is a distributed computer vision system. To squeeze okay. all the last you know bits of performance out of it that we can, mm-hmm. um, you really do want it to not all run in one place. It makes sense to have some of it run on the device, some run in the back end. Uh, so talk a little bit about that in more detail. Like how do you, you know, what is running on the device? How do you partition what's running on the device and what's running in the cloud? Yeah. So at a high level, um, the device is doing um, the attentional mechanism. It's doing the segmentation and, tr- and tracking of what is interesting and new. Okay. Um, and then um, there's nuance here, but at a high level, it's doing that. Um, so at, at kind of a simplistic perspective, you're not sending a bunch of frames up to the cloud if there's nothing happening. That's largely correct. Yeah. yeah. We do have to send some data once in a while, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, one frame every you know, few seconds, basically. Okay. Um, so we can, uh, this is actually so we can present to you a beautiful summary of the day. Oh, okay. Um, right. So you, 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 we call it a, a, a smart time lapse or a daily okay. recap um, where you, you, know, you press one button and you get a, you know, a, a 10 second or one minute kind of summary of what happened during the day. And it goes fast during the boring parts and it goes slow when there's something of interest to you. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the, but yeah, generally we actually we don't have to stream um, thirty frames per second because it's actually not what customers really care about. Mm-hmm. Um, customers don't care about you know what were the RGB pixel values uh, at like three forty seven a.m. you know yesterday. Mm-hmm. What they care about is you know did my kids come home on time and what has the dog done since I left the house because I just think it makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside or mm-hmm. you know did, was anybody new here and who mm-hmm. was new here last week just you know show me these things. Yeah, that's what they care about. You know. We're, with traditional home cameras, we're kind of awash in in data, but we don't have much, you know, useful information. And that's what Lighthouse is all about: is mm-hmm. taking that that enormous stream of data and and compressing it down into just the bits that you actually care about. Uh, interesting. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, you know, being kind of here at CES and seeing, you know, tons of different consumer oriented products that are trying to incorporate AI in one way or another. Uh, are there any things that you've kind of learned that were surprising about 
you know, pulling AI into consumer oriented products? Yes. Um, I, I actually, um, when, when we started Lighthouse, myself and my co-founder, um, I thought it would be the, um, the AI problems that were the hardest across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are hard for sure. There's no question of that. Um, it turns out there's other hard problems that you have to solve along the way. Hmm. Um, for example, getting the UX, right. Mm -hmm. Um, like getting the, like the UI and the, like the interface and the user experience really right. That's yeah. actually quite difficult. It's, been, it's something we spend a lot of time on. Um, because what we, you know, ultimately the reason we exist is to deliver a delightful and useful experience to our customers. Mm -hmm. And we're able to do that with AI, but like, that's not the only thing. Yeah. Um, and it's actually, it can be quite hard to get those things right. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in, you know, breaking new ground in a new kind of interactive assistant. Um, how does one actually, you know, build the best interface to this kind of thing? It, it takes a lot of work and iteration. You know, do you have uh, kind of the lighthouse laws of effective, intelligent user experience design? Like, have you, uh, you know, boiled, you know, what you've learned down into key ideas that you tell a, a new team member? You know, I'm not sure we've refined it to that point. Okay. Where I could concisely communicate something. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I've, I've, I've asked people this uh, on and off for... Um, the last couple of years, I think that uh, it, it strikes me that, you know, we've developed a fair amount of, um, you know, a fair amount of methodology around traditional user experience via mobile, via the web. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that there's, you know, some set of rules that will evolve around designing intelligent systems uh, or not that that's kind of too broad, but um, presenting intelligent experiences to mm. consumers. Um, but I haven't really found, you know, no one said, oh, yeah, I read this book about it. <laughs> We're still too early for that. <laughs> too early for books. Um, there, is but, one, there is one guiding principle, actually, that, that is, is worthy of mention here. Um, uh -huh. It's something that's always kind of in the back of my mind with this kind of interface. The reason it exists um, is to make useful information accessible to you as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. That's the reason natural language interfaces are good. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, stepping outside of Lighthouse, looking at something like Alexa or Google Home, mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons they're so good is because, you know, you don't have to go find your phone or pull your phone out of your pocket and like unlock right. it and go to this, you know, go to the right app and then and then play your music and say, no, like play it on this interface. And then, like, mm -hmm. oh, and then finally it comes out where, you know, no, you just, you just yell across the room, hey, play this thing. Mm -hmm. And it just works, mm -hmm. right? And that like the reason that's amazing is because it saves you 10 seconds. Right. And it, and it seems so trivial, right? But it's not. It really, like, it really, really, really matters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you look at this from the, um, I don't know if you want to call it the, the nerd point of view, certainly this is me, right? Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it's all about reducing latency and increasing bandwidth in the human-machine interface. Mm -hmm. That's the point of natural language, mm -hmm. um, is that you have a thought in your mind. There's a thing you want to do, mm -hmm. and right now, Generally, you have to translate that into, okay, I'm going to pull up in my phone, I'm going to tap on these buttons to get to the right app, and then I'm going to tap on some more buttons to do the thing I'm trying to do, and right. I have to go to this menu and adjust the slider bar, and it's, it's like, right, it's just like, right. it's terrible. What you should do is, is there's that thought in your mind, just say the thought. Right. right. And it just happens. Yeah. Right? That's what that is. That is just so much better. That is an, it's a, I don't know, it's an order of magnitude improvement in, in latency, in that interface between this intelligence in my head and this intelligence in my phone. Mm-hmm. On the NLP side of things, did you start out with any of the um, kind of popular cloud-based platforms for doing that kind of stuff? Like the, I forget what it's called now, x.ai, mm. you know, what, what that is. But, you know, all the cloud vendors have their own. Or did you kind of roll your own? Right. You know, they're, they are useful prototyping platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and there may even be some applications where they get you all the way. Yeah. Um, but that is, n that is not the case for Lighthouse. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can tell you that for sure because uh, like I used one of them over a weekend to produce a little demo of like, hey, this is what, this is what I have in mind. I think this might right. be a way to really nail the user, the user interface for this thing. Yeah. Um, uh, by, by the way, actually, I mean, when we started Lighthouse, we knew, how to, we knew the direction to go into to solve the perception problems, but we didn't know how to solve the UX problems, mm -hmm. right? And, and it was only along the way that we discovered that, like, oh, my God, it's, it, natural language interfaces are the way to do this. Mm -hmm. Like, it is actually not, it is not possible 
as far as we are aware, to produce an interface with buttons and sliders and you know whatever else it might be to, to get you to be able to say, uh, hey, tell me if you see anyone new at the doorstep while Cindy and I are away next week. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, how, like, how would you do that? With, like, you just can't, right? But with natural language, it just works. It just works. It's right. amazing. Right. Yep. Right. I've gotten that feedback quite a lot from folks that are trying to productize NLP, like the, the uh, platforms are an interesting way to start, but you run out of runway in terms of their flexibility and ability to get you all the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah so, so we built all our own. Okay. It's the, it's the only thing to do in this area. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, tech stack generally? Um, yeah. Yeah, happy to. Um, so we use, we use a lot of C++ mm-hmm. um, because this is real-time. Both on device and in cloud? Both. Okay. Um, it's a real-time performance, memory-intensive computer vision, mm-hmm. right, running at scale. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, either at scale on the back end uh, or on a you know, limited compute device out on the front end that mm-hmm. is touching hardware, mm-hmm. right? And so in both of these places, C++ is the right thing to use yeah. at that level. Now, when we're prototyping a new, uh, a new architecture for our, you know, the deep learning system, yeah, it's totally reasonable to, you know, twiddle around in, you know, in Python to, to have, you know, faster iterations on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Uh, ultimately, when it's like building and deploying real systems, it's it ends up being C plus plus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, did you build out the NLP platform on C plus plus as well, like the whole system for intents and all that kind of I, stuff? I'm simplifying a bit, of course. So, the the core computer vision system is in C plus plus. There's yep. a Java layer around that because okay. that's that's easier to interface with your phones, for mm-hmm. example. Um, and it turns out that's also a good place to build your natural language processing. Okay. Um, for whatever reason. Um, in academia, at, at least my my circles of academia back in my Stanford days, um, natural language processing was generally done in Java, um, hmm. and computer vision on self driving cars, for example, was like all C plus mm-hmm. um, And, and it, you know, it probably is the case that you know on self driving cars, C plus is a more natural fit because you have to interface with sensors and you have real time requirements, sure. and it's like very heavy data. Whereas natural language yeah. processing is often less so. Yeah. Um, so in any case, that's that is a natural fit, and our our natural language system is is you know it lives out. Out there and is the Java ecosystem for the natural language stuff stuff as mature as the Python ecosystem or more maybe um, that's a good question I I don't think I actually know okay yeah they like were from a, a company perspective where are you in kind of the life cycle of bringing this product to market ah we are very close to general availability. Okay. Um, so you, in fact, you can go to our website right now, www.light.house, um, and, and enter your email, and mm-hmm. uh, we we will add you to our, our special offer list. And if okay. you're lucky, you might get one. Okay. Um, and uh, and if not, we will uh, we will be available for um, for anybody to buy in the not too distant future. Okay. We are we are quite close now. Nice. I've seen pictures of the device. It's like, it looks like a, it's not a mobile device. It's stationary. You put it on a countertop or something like that. Right. You know, you either have to be very, very strategic about where you put this thing, or you have to envision a world where you've got 10 of these all over the place. Kind of like Alexa's becoming, right? You have one in every room or something like that. Is that the way you're thinking about the world? And like, you've got, you eventually have a full 3D and uh, you know three color map of everyone's home, or is it something different? Yeah, actually not. I mean, maybe I'm not doing my job as like you know CEO of this company and like oh you should have one in every room or something. But <laughs> I actually don't see it that way. Um, um, I think several in a um, in a normal sized uh, you know middle class American house, two to three is probably the right number, and you get a mm-hmm. ton of value out of one. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can kind of you know you get one, and you play with it, and you're like, oh my god, this is amazing, and you can get two and two and three. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually don't think it makes that much sense to have um, every single room covered. Um, it's usually um, particular areas of interest. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we often see the first one goes in an area that is kind of near the front door. So you see like what traffic is coming and going, mm-hmm. but you also see a reasonable amount of the kind of the floor plan of the home. So you mm-hmm. get a sense of what's going on there. Um, but other, uh, common places for, for lighthouse to end up in are you know, in the garage because often the, you know, the door might get left open and you want to know if somebody's in there, mm-hmm. um, uh, or you might have tools out there and children and you want to know like, is the, you know, are the kids 
going out there when I'm not home, things right. like that. Um, or, you know, upstairs in the kid's room or just outside of the kid's room to see if they're getting up out of bed in the middle of the night. I mean, mm -hmm. you, can, you would literally just say, you know, hey, Lighthouse, you know, tell me if you see the kids out in the hallway between, you know, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And then mm -hmm. it just works. Um, we need to implement the call me if you see this feature, okay. it's, you know, coming down the road. Okay. Um, um, but it's those kind of areas of, of, you know, particular interests, and it depends on the particular homeowner. Um, another common place is kind of in the living room, looking, um, looking into the area where the dog hangs out um, mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, just you know, get the warm and fuzzy feelings of like, hey, what's my dog been up to since I left home? Mm -hmm. Right. So if you had this and you pointed it at the front door, can it, um, you know, can it effectively, you know, track the state of the, of the home and kind of be a general purpose presence detector, like, you know, keeps track of someone walked in, so that person walked out, so they're no longer inside and at any given time, like query it and determine who's in the house. Mm. So we can make that query and that does work, mm -hmm. um, but we don't do it with computer vision actually. Okay. Um, and the, the, you know, the reason is we, we, there's often many entrances and exits to a home and we don't mm -hmm. expect that you buy one lighthouse for every entrance and exit okay. necessarily. Right. Um, so the way we do presence absence detection is, is just, you know, is with phone presence and absence. You know, GPS is a part of that, but also looking okay. at Bluetooth signals coming out of the devices. I right? was just going to say, I just yeah. started playing with the Samsung smart things and it does it the same way and it kind of sucks. Like it's, it's very coarse. You have to work hard at it to get yeah. it to work well. But I mean, there is a big advantage in that we have a Bluetooth signal coming out of the device. Ah, okay. That's going to so work like, a lot better than, yeah. you know, you, the GPS, you're within a mile of your house. So therefore you're in your house. If you just use location services, uh, like as provided by the standard phone APIs mm -hmm. on its own, it, it would be hard to make it really good. Yeah. Um, now, to be fair, also, like we will not cover the case where you walk out of your house and you go to your neighbor's house. It's going to be hard for us to tell. Um, right. Right. And like, it will still think you're home, but when you get right. far enough away, then it, you know, th this, this gets you uh, almost all of the way. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, assuming that you've got your phone with you. That is correct. Yep. Um, interesting. Um, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons that the, the, the children classifier is a big deal because they often don't have phones at all. Right. And you want to know right. what are they up to and did they get home on this, you know, uh, on their schedule and so on. Mm -hmm. Right. And so does this, does the Lighthouse have uh, an API? Is it something that you envision people um, kind of getting and hacking on? Or is it uh, more, you know, just kind of the stated use cases yeah. thus far? Um, you know, we have seen a tremendous enthusiasm for adding um, Lighthouse capabilities to other parts of the the IoT world of the smart home. Right. Um, you know, actuate this smart home, you know, device when you see something or other, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and I'm really excited to get to the point where we can we can actually start to tap into that. Um, we're not there just yet, uh, mm -hmm. but it's certainly on the roadmap. Um, I, we, we will be deploying something like that, um, some integration with other smart home capabilities that, um, you know, that early adopters can, can plug together. Um, we will be providing that um, sometime this year. Mm -hmm. It will not be immediate though. Yeah, yeah. What's the long-term yeah. you know, view for the company? What are you trying to accomplish? So when I take a step back and look at why Lighthouse exists, mm -hmm. um, the home is a piece of it for sure, and it's a very exciting piece, um, but it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. um, the reason Lighthouse exists is to improve human life uh, by augmenting our physical spaces with useful and accessible intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that's stated very broadly, um, quite deliberately. Like, there's sensors beyond computer, beyond cameras, beyond, beyond time of flight cameras, um, and you know beyond vision generally that are very interesting and in that we absolutely should integrate into this kind of thing. Um, and it also goes beyond the home. There's many different AI service domains that are that are quite interesting to us. Um, and we're not spending a lot of time there right now because you know it's hard enough to do one of these things. And so we're very, very sure. focused on delivering the home product um, into the world and having that be a, a, a big success and make people's lives better. Mm -hmm. um, but once that is established and, and growing more or less on its own, um, then it'll be time to, to take our attention to another AI service domain. Mm -hmm. well, what's an example of uh, another one beyond the home that's interesting? Uh, elderly care is a big deal. Okay. It is, it is a particularly big deal, and, and we are particularly well-suited to solve problems in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and we're actually, we're starting to see hints of this already, um, even in the home, uh, mm -hmm. for aging in place in particular, where uh, you have a, you know, an, an elderly loved one um, who 
maybe they're maybe they you know they might need to go into a, a facility uh, like a nursing care facility um, but you kind of want to extend their time in their own home as long as you possibly can mm -hmm. um, and a system like lighthouse is actually really good for mm -hmm. for this for this use case um, because you know they get a great security camera out of it right, right? or you know a camera they can you know see what their dog was up to or whatever it might be mm -hmm. um, and then the you know the the, the adult child um, gets the early warning system mm -hmm. where um, you don't have to be looking at it every day. You just say, you know, hey, Lighthouse, if you don't see anyone in the kitchen by 8 a.m. every day, just let me know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, it might be that they just slept in, but maybe today's a good day for you to call mm -hmm. and just see how are you doing. Yeah, right yeah. Now. now, it seems like there are tons of folks kind of nibbling away at pieces of this space. Like, how many devices does Amazon have alone? Like, they've got the, the key thing, which has a camera. They've got the... Uh, the look thing, which is your kind of fashion visual system, but you know, it's, you know, they seem to be very gung ho of getting cameras in your home, right? Yeah. You know, how does a consumer react to all these people trying to push cameras into their houses <laughs> and point clouds and all of this yeah. stuff? No, it's interesting. Um, so there, there is a very fundamentally different perspective um, on this space when you're at a place like Amazon. Um, their goal is to is to magnify their their marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're trying to sell things. Mm -hmm. That's that's why they're trying to put a camera into your house so that oh we can deliver more things to you, mm -hmm. right? Or we can you know understand that like oh this scarf would look really good on you. I'll try to sell this to you, <laughs> right? or whatever it might be, right? I mean that's that's legitimately the stated purpose right. of that device. Right. Um, with Lighthouse, it's very different. Um, we, we we exist to provide this you know, delightful AI service to you in return for money, and that's the end of the transaction. Hmm. We're we're not looking to you know sell you a better hat or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but but you know taking a step back from all that, um, it is super interesting what's happening in the home generally. You know, at mm -hmm. this CES in particular, there's this you know. A, I, I almost want to describe it as an epic slugfest between you know Alexa and Google Assistant to mm -hmm. to like you know which like oh my God this is the AI is coming to the home in this particular form right and it's really interesting and you know who knows where it's going to be a, a year from now mm -hmm. um, but what is very clear is that adding perception capabilities and having then that same kind of conversational capability is is super exciting and that's kind of right where Lighthouse is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's often this question about like is you know thing X is it like a product or a feature and you know, what you're doing in a lot of ways is like bringing together the, you know, the vision piece, which is, um, you know, I guess I'm wondering like long term, like does, you know, do, does something like Lighthouse and Alexa, do they converge? Like, do you, do you want to, if, if Alexa was more open, like, do you want to have to deal with the NLP, you know, or do you, you know, want the, the vision to, to kind of tack onto that or, take advantage of the broader ecosystem. And I guess I'm mostly thinking about this from the perspective of a consumer, like how many of these devices do I want in my house <laughs> listening to, uh, you know, listening to everything. And, you know, already I've got like, you know, the, the Google home and you have to, it has its wake word and mm -hmm. Alexa, I've got two different wake words in the house. It's like, it's already getting a bit maddening. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, one thing is, you know, with, with lighthouse, um, you actually don't talk to the device itself. Um, oh really? Yeah, because usually the responses we're providing are video, and there's there's no there's no screen. So you're like talking to your device. device yeah, and oh. and usually you're out and about. Right? No, that makes a lot. It's more usually sense. you're you're at work or you know you're you're on the train or something, and yeah. you're just like you know hey what did the dog do since I left or like you know hey it had you know what did the kids do while I was out yesterday oh, and, and then you you see the results there, um, right? Because it's all about delivering video answers in video form, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so we won't be adding to that confusion um, about like so many different things that that like can respond to you in the home. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an answer to that problem, but I don't know. Go chat with the Alexa folks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. All right, well, Alex, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. I enjoyed learning about uh, you, your background, Lighthouse. Uh, sounds like an interesting space, and good luck here at CES. Cool. Well, thank you so much. This has been fun. All right, thank you. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. Remember, for your chance to win in our AI at Home giveaway, head on over to twimmelaicom slash myaicontest for complete details. 
For more information on Alex, Lighthouse, or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 103. Thanks once again to Intel AI for their sponsorship of this series. To learn more about their partnership with Ferrari North America Challenge and the other things they've been up to, visit ai.intel.com. Of course, we'd be delighted to hear from you, either via a comment on the show notes page or via Twitter, directly to me at, at Sam Sherrington or to the show at, at Twimmel AI. Thanks once again for listening and catch you next time.